people. Um, I'll just start by introducing you and you can give a fuller introduction. Um, I first met uh, Representative McClellan in Virginia when uh, they were fighting to ratify and become the 38th necessary state to uh, to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. I believe you carry, how long did you carry that bill before it actually got across the finish line in 2020? I think you're muted. Oh yeah, I am. sorry. Uh, well, me personally, that was that was the first year I carried it, but it had been introduced and even passed the Senate multiple times, at least twenty years, if not longer. <laughs> so this is a fight twenty years in the making, uh, in a hundred year struggle to get it across the finish line. Uh, Senator when then Senator McClellan in the Virginia uh, in the Virginia legislature led on many, many issues of, of gender justice, including uh, reproductive rights and freedom, your longtime known champion on abortion access, and many, many other issues. And now, uh, when I, uh, when I said, uh, Representative McClellan joined us in the House of Representatives, uh, I went to your your party, and I remember you said, "Could you have imagined when I testified uh, for the ERA that I would have been here in the House?" And I said, "Yes, we all could have imagined it. You're perfect for this role, and it's really a dream come true for you to be now in the House where you belong, working on the ERA." So thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, um, Kate, for having me, and and thank you everybody for joining on tonight. Um, and I'll kind of pick up where Kate left off. You know, it, it, it was, it's was it been a long time coming as we all know over a hundred years. Uh, but in Virginia, um, how I came to carry the, the resolution, I remember again, every year it was introduced, multiple years it passed the Senate, it would stall in the house. And I remember sitting in the rules committee in 2019 when um and, and then it was bipartisan so we had a, a a white male republican senator glenn sturdivant who carried the era and that was part of a strategy because at the time um the republicans were in control in both the house and the senate and um i remember looking around the room and the only women of color, there's, the room was packed. And the only women of color, there were three of us, one on the on the committee, Senator Mamie Locke, and then Senator Rosalind Dance and I, who happened to be there waiting to present other bills. And I remember thinking, where are we? Because while the ERA would help all women, um, women of color probably have the most to gain because we have been the last to achieve every major right in America. Um, and um, I remember thinking we need to be not only a part of this fight, but we need to be in the front of this fight. And I couldn't help but think about, I'm a Delta, I remember Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. And our first public act as a sorority was to march in the March for Suffrage in, in Washington in 1913, months after we were founded. Um, and we were asked to march in the back. And um, so I thought, you know, we've been there, part of the fight for equality and justice from the beginning, but we need to do more than just sit in the back. So combining sort of over the next year, and, and many of you have probably heard about the scrappy VA Ratify ERA organization, um, a multi-organization group that included them and the Deltas and now and you know every group you can think of really worked to do two things. One, educate people because there was some polling done that showed a lot of young people, not just young women, but young people thought the ERA was already the law thought we already had equality. Um, and, and so we realized, you know, they're not part of this fight because they think the fight's been won. So we spent that summer educating people on why we still needed the ARA, that it wasn't the law, why the 14th Amendment wasn't enough to 
uh, provide equality for women. Um, and we, that was an election year where the entire House and Senate were up for re-election. And so we made sure that people understood the ERA is on the ballot. Um, Democrats won in the November elections. We took over both the House and the Senate. And the very first bill that was introduced in both the House and the Senate by a multi-generational coalition of Black women, uh, Jennifer Carroll Foy in the House, Mamie Locke and I in the Senate. So you had Mamie Locke as a baby boomer, me as Gen X, and uh, Delegate Foy as a millennial. Um, filed those bills as SJ and H and HJ1. And very early on in the session, uh, we were able to pass those resolutions in our respective houses and, and then cross over. And we finally did it. <laughs> we finally did it. And to be a part of that moment, particularly anybody that knows me or if any of you have heard me speak before, you know, there's probably no bigger history nerd than me. Um, and to think about how Virginia was founded, how our country was founded. Um, and in 1619, um, that's yeah. when the very first, what became General Assembly met, the House of Burgess met starting representative government in the, the British colonies. Um, a month later, the first Afri recorded Africans came uh, to the shores of Jamestown, traded for food or supplies. Um, and then two months after that, the first British women were, were recruited to come to the colony. So when you think about the hierarchy of how Virginia was founded, and you think about how Virginia was on the right side and the wrong side of history so many times, birthplace of American democracy, but the birthplace of American slavery. Um, how, you know, we had one of the cases that led to school desegregation, but we also led the fight for massive resistance. Um, for us to be the first, the, the final state to put us over the top, to ratify the ERA, to me was poetic justice. And for that to be led by a coalition of multi-generational Black women was poetic justice. So, we still got work to do. We thought we were done. <laughs> we thought we were done, but uh, we're not. So now being a member of Congress and being a member of the ERA caucus and fighting to make sure that we get the ERA across the finish line, um, I, you know what? I'm ready to fight that fight because I, I realized a long time ago, I'm fighting the same fights as my mother and my grandmother and my great-grandmother. But I keep fighting those fights so that my children and, and their children don't have to. So it won't take another 100 years. We know that. Hopefully we, after the midterms, if not now, after the midterms, uh, it is, it's just a matter of time. But I want to stop and say thank you because I know many of you have been fighting this fight, many of you longer uh, than, than we'd all like to admit. And so I want to stop and say thank you for doing that. And we'll fight a little bit longer, but that's okay. Ah, um, uh, I love having conversations with you because you care about history and like really ground yourself in, in that history. So thank you for sharing. Um, and I, I think you'll like this. Um, Crystal Eastman, who was one of the co-authors of the original Equal Rights Amendment in 1923, she said, the ERA is worth it, even if it takes 10 years. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And so, you know, they were coming on the heels of just passing uh, and ratifying the 19th Amendment. So they're like, we did that. How hard could this be? Uh, yeah. And so I think, you know, the sentiment holds that it is worth it no matter how long it takes. Um, but maybe she underestimated uh, by, by a factor of 10 how long it might actually take. Um, and so I'm really, I would like to dig in a little bit more to what you talked about, um, Black women specifically and women of color being on the front lines of the ERA. 
Um, because as we know from history that, that that's been the case, you know, Mary Church Terrell, black suffragist testified in Congress in support of the ERA. Um, you know, there's been legislators all along the way, including, and, and, and activists, including Polly Murray, Barbara Jordan, um, you know, uh, fighting for the equal rights amendment, but never really getting to the front of that mm -hmm. you know, coverage or centering in the conversation. Um, so, I mean, I'm not going to ask why, because we know the why, <laughs> um, but how, how do we, how did you go about changing that in Virginia? Because I think that really, um, we saw it in Nevada with Pat Spearman, um, who we invited to be on the panel and is actually staying at my house tonight, um, but, but she wasn't able to be here because she's at the vice president's residence for an event. Um, so we will forgive her because she's going to talk to Kamala about the ERA. Uh, but so Pat, you know, Pat got things going in Nevada and then Juliana Stratton and others in Illinois, and then um, you and Delegate Carol Foy um, and others, uh, maybe Locke in Virginia. And, 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 you know, just interested in your thoughts. And, and now, of course, the caucus, the ERA caucus, um, you know, you're a vice chair, uh, uh, Representatives Bush and Presley leading the way um, with many other uh, incredible, incredible electeds. So how do we, Black women and women of color have been doing the work and have been advocating for the ERA the entire time. How do we, how did you in Virginia change that conversation and how do we move forward in a different way um, so that we give credit where credit is due and we center the stories and, and leadership of the people who, who stand to benefit most? It was really intentional. Um, and again, it, 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 it really was, again, the ERA was something I had always supported. Um, but I think I and and many other Black women, you know, we we had a lot on our plate. And I think there's some issues that people naturally look to us to lead on, you know, voting rights um, being being one, public education, public health. And we had a lot of fights going on in Virginia. Um, we were fighting, uh, you know, abortion restrictions. We were fighting, um, you know, voting restrictions. And it's sometimes a lot easier to draw those connections. And I think sitting in that hearing, what really struck me was the fact that women of color had the most to gain because the intersectionality of racism and sexism has meant that every civil rights movement in American history, we were the last to benefit. Um, and, you know, even when, when Roe was decided and there was a fundamental right to abortion, abortion wasn't accessible for a lot of women of color okay. because of the intersection of racism, and Jim Crow laws that led to disparities in access to health care. Um, when the, when the, when, you know, and I did a whole article on the history of voting rights in America, Black men were the first to get the right to vote. And even when uh, the 19th Amendment passed, many Black women couldn't vote because of the, the Jim Crow laws. And so we were the last to get the right to vote with the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And I heard from a lot of young Black women in particular, that's not our fight. And I realized we had to show it is our fight because we've got the most to gain. Um, and so it really was intentional to say, we can't just you know, lead from the back. We need to lead from the front. We need to make sure everybody understands why we have the most to gain. Um, and and bring this coalition together of, 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 of women of color who had been on the sidelines for a long time. Um, and I think for me, it was a little bit personal because, 
if you <laughs> trying to find evidence of black women in the south who fought for the right to vote is really hard everybody knows um you know everybody knows susan b anthony you know you can list elizabeth Cady stanton you can list the names and their work was very clear but for black women who were part of the suffragette movement there were many who didn't want us to be part of it um and for many of us, it was not a suffrage organization where we worked through that. It was it was a broader organization where we did suffrage work. But but those names weren't in the history books. So it wasn't until I personally did research and found, you know, Maggie Walker was a suffragette. Um, there were many suffragettes here in Richmond who were intentionally left out of the publicity who were intentionally left out of the story we realized that couldn't happen with the era we could not let that happen again with the era thank you um and thank you for uncovering that history and talking about it too um i think um so many things that i want to follow up with but one of them it kind of picks on that thread of history um there is a story that i write about in my book um where uh uh, Mary Church Terrell and other Black suffragists after the 19th, the ratification of the 19th Amendment went to the National Women's Party headquarters, physically, like literally went to the National Women's head, he, uh, Party headquarters, which is here in D.C. and is now a national monument, uh, the Sewell Belmont House. So they went there and they said, OK, listen, um, we had the 19th Amendment ostensibly, but we can't vote. Uh, and it's going to be a long time until we uh, get suffrage. Like it's it's going to be a long time until universal suffrage is actually universal. So how do we move forward on that? Um, and essentially, Alice Paul and others said we're done with suffrage and we're moving on to the ERA. So I think a lot of perception that the ERA is in our fight. Um, stems back to that moment, stems back to that choice that they made um, to give up on universal suffrage and move on to the ERA. Um, and so, and, and the racism and, you know, inherent bias that came with that choice. Um, and so I'm wondering, I'd like to teach that not to cast, I, I think historical figures are complicated. And if you've done any like <laughs> history research, it turns out like they're just people um, and they make mistakes and that's not to excuse them. That's just to say they make mistakes. And I like to talk about this with young people and not, you know, particularly when, as we're coming up on the centennial, um, not only to venerate Alice Paul, but also call attention to mistakes made. And the reason yeah. I point that out is because I want young people to know that like these were choices. It wasn't inevitable that that happened, that they made a choice to do that. And well, we we can make different choices. And I would even, I would even take you back far, farther than that. Um, because in the fight for, for suffrage, a choice was made yep. that stemmed from the 14th amendment itself. Um, because originally the abolitionist movement was, was very integrated. But when the 14th Amendment was passed, it was the first time that the word race appeared in the Constitution. And that sowed the seeds of the rift in the suffrage and later equality movement because um, you had one camp that said um, that very expressly that if they didn't want universal suffrage and that they did not want to fight for the 15th amendment to grant um, black men the right to vote before women had it. Um, and you saw a very real rift, particularly in the South, but not exclusively in the South. Um, and you saw racist language and racist justification for women's suffrage. Um, you had one camp that basically said, well, if you allow white women to vote, then that will help to combat the fact that now black men could vote. But you had another camp that used that against it and said, well, if you grant women the right to vote, 
that includes black women. And that means you're going to be voting with your servants. And this is all, it, you know, it was not, <laughs> it wasn't subtle. It was express. And especially in the South, especially in Virginia. And that's why um, a lot of the black women who were fighting for suffrage did it under the umbrella of, you know, human rights organizations or community uh, improvement. And, and it was sort of, you really had to dig deep to say, oh, they were doing more than just fighting for universal education. They were also fighting for universal suffrage, but they had to do it in a way that was coded. Um, so yeah, sorry I, to go down that rabbit hole, but I think that that schism began when the 14th Amendment was passed and came to a head uh, when the 19th Amendment was passed. You're exactly right when, when some white women said, we're done. Yeah, we and got I, what we wanted. <laughs> I think you're. I think you're right in that, um, and and I appreciate you bringing that up um, because again, I think these are we can frame a lot of people frame this as inevitable. It's like, oh, that's everyone was racist then, or like you know what I mean, like oh, that's just how it was. Um, but these were very specific choices made by very specific people and leaders of the movement who didn't see themselves as racist. They thought it was strategic. You know what I mean? Like they, they cared about, you know, Alice Paul, for example, she cared about suffrage. She was from a Quaker family. She didn't see herself as racist. She thought in her mind, like, this is, I'm doing this to win. You know what I mean? Um, yes. and so I think lessons for the future, I think is very important. So I'm, I'm interested to hear what you have to say um, about like, okay, so they made that choice and like, they thought they were strategic. How can we make different choices? How can we say that like, it's, you know, for example, with trans rights, like I know a lot of ERA activists are transphobic or anti-trans and they say like, oh, this is only about women. Um, and so you kind of see some of these same echoes of like throwing certain people under the bus in order to do something you see as strategic. Um, so how can we act differently, move forward differently um, and intersectionally um, in, in the current ERA movement? That's a great question. I mean, first, it's very important that we that we talk about and recognize and acknowledge this history um, because it helps us to see the pattern happening again, and it allows us to be more intentional going forward. is is the first step, um, and and part of that is making sure. And, and I'll take you back to Civics One Hundred and One. We are a government by of and for the people. And, and whether it's passing the ERA or passing legislation, it is a government process. And, and so it is going to reflect the perspectives and the needs of the people who are sitting around the table. All of us, our political views and are, are, are shaped by our life experiences and what we know. So we need to make sure that we are having as wide you know, as diverse perspectives around that table as possible when we are developing strategy, when we are developing talking points, um, you know, communication plans, um, because we are going to have blind spots based on, well, that's not my experience. So I don't understand it. I'm afraid of it, or I just don't think about it. I need to make sure somebody's at the table that has that life experience. And it's not just with with the ERA, I mean, we see, we see it with a lot of different issues that affect the trans community where non-trans people who may not know or know that they know a transgendered person, they don't, it's not their life experience and they don't, they feel uncomfortable. Um, and you can take the sports, the sports discussion. I had you know, with, with one, a very progressive friend of mine who said, well, I don't think it's fair that my, you know, my daughter would be, would be on a team with a boy who is bigger and stronger. And I said, well, first of all, transgender girls are girls. <laughs> um, and if your concern is your daughter is competing against someone who's bigger and may weigh more, that's not a gender issue. That's a weight and height issue. Let's let's solve that problem, but let's not 
um, bully and discriminate against and, and, and frankly, otherwise transgender girls because you don't understand something. How about you talk to one? And I think the most effective community, the most effective thing I have seen in the argument about transgender sports was a video that featured a transgender hockey player and her teammates. And it's like, sometimes you need to step back and let the person who is suffering or facing the discrimination tell their story. Um, I think sometimes as allies, we rush to, con- to try to be the voice or be the champion. It's like, sometimes you need to step back and let the person most impacted by the policy be their own spokesperson. Yeah, and I think um, that brings me to, I, I'm thinking of our hearing that we had in oversight and you participated as a witness. Um, and I remember I, w- I was helping plan it on the staff side of the oversight committee. And I was very, very, very insistent and, and advocated very hard to have Bambi Salcedo testify at the hearing. Um, Bambi is a member of, or a founder of the Trans Latina Coalition. And there were like a lot of feelings about that happening, let's just say. Um, I think it was the first time ever that there was a trans uh, trans f- a woman advocate and uh, immigrant testifying in, in the house. And also Bambi started her testimony in Spanish, um, which was like, it was just like a lot of like mind blown emojis happening on the Republican side. Um, and all that to say, I felt like having Bambi's testimony there was just incredibly powerful. And she presented on the ERA in a way that no one else could have. Um, And I I still remember, I'm sure you do too. It was, it was incredible. Oh, she Um, brought me tears. (laughs) Um, And, and she talked about why we need the ERA in addition to the Equality Act and why for trans women specifically, um, they stand to gain and why she felt so passionate about it. And it was really, really important, just exactly like you said, to hear her story from her. Um, and so I felt really proud of that. Um, but speaking of that hearing, uh, you uh, were there and gave incredible testimony, but also one of the things that we, one of the reasons we really valued what you had to say and, and wanted you to participate in that hearing is um, the connection between the ERA and abortion rights and access. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, I remember in those prep sessions, we were like, okay, they're going to ask this, they're going to ask this. And you're like, oh, um, this is all on me. Um, and we're like, yes, that's why you're here. Um, but it was wonderful to have you. And I'm wondering, you know, in Virginia, it was like you said, there was like this whole campaign. You went around the States with boat equality and all these other people and, you know, traveled with an ice cream bus and like, you know, took, took um, popsicles for equality all around the state. Um, and there were, there were tough conversations in, in the in the Virginia legislature about abortion and the, the overlap with the ERA. Um, so can you talk about that a little bit and, and specifically, uh, you know, not necessarily the technicalities of how the ERA will cover abortion rights and access, but more like, how we distance ourselves from the conversations in the past where yeah. things like this has nothing to do with abortion, which was yeah. set on the floor um, by people who shall remain nameless. Um, and like, how do we move forward in a movement that was like so reticent again, because they thought it was strategic. Like they're like, we got to get this passed in Florida and Georgia and Louisiana and Virginia, you know, places that are tough places for reproductive rights. So they thought it was strategic to kind of throw abortion under the bus. Um, And now we're facing a moment where we're trying to reclaim um, and make those connections. So like, can you just talk a little bit about your testimony and how you think we can kind of gain some ground on that? Sure. Well, again, you know, remember the history. Um, What stalled the ERA? It stalled while you know with the rise of the the reproductive freedom movement and with Roe versus Wade and um 
you know, that became the the rallying cry for the anti-choice community to rally against the ERA and explicitly make that connection. And it was very effective because in this in the 70s and the 80s, um, abortion was still, you know, probably 50-50 in the political realm. Um, we've come a long way since. I mean, polls show, you know, he, here in, in Virginia, I think it's like 77 percent of voters like our laws either as they are or want them to be even less restrictive as far as access to abortion. I think people have become, as you have had more women in office um, and people who have been pregnant. Um, fun fact, I was the first member of the House of Delegates to be pregnant while in office and I was pregnant in 2010, the first year that we had a mandatory ultrasound bill. And I had just had one because I was in my first trimester. I knew it was transvaginal. Um, if someone got an it got a, 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 a ultrasound in the first trimester, because I I just had one. I knew exactly what that meant. I knew how abortion laws impacted miscarriage management. I knew that abortions after the first trimester were not because somebody said, oh, I've changed my mind, but because something's gone horribly wrong. And I was able to start telling those stories, whereas before it was this theoretical debate by people who had never been pregnant or, you know, in some cases had been pregnant. Been playing the entire time. I don't know why she just threw a yeah. fit. Um, I, I think it's important now to recognize the political landscape has changed, especially with Dobbs. Because you had a whole, you know, more than one generation of women who grew up knowing I have a constitutional right to an abortion. Now that's gone. Now that's gone. And discrimination on the basis of sex includes the only medical procedure criminalized in America is the one that people with certain reproductive health organs need. I don't know what more than that would be on the basis of sex. So if you have the ERA, you have a constitutional text now that's explicit. Whereas before, you know, Roe was under a penumbra of, of constitutional rights that were brought together under a right to privacy. That's now gone. But if you have explicit text that says, you know, equality under the law on the basis of sex, you don't need a row framework anymore. And, and now we would have a constitutional right to reproductive freedom because reproductive freedom is dependent on your sex. If only one sex, only, if only one type of reproductive health is criminalized and regulated, that's pretty explicitly against the ERA. Amen. <laughs> uh, and I think, and I think also, um, yeah, it's just so interesting to me talking about uh, his, the history Griswold. So in Griswold, uh, in the contraceptive active access case that originally, you know, we got privacy um, from the advocates actually argued uh, that it submitted amicus briefs actually argued on the basis of equality. They're like, if you if you want to find something in the constitution, like why not find equality? Uh, and then of course we know the rest of the history that the Supreme Court didn't, and they found it under privacy and you know uh, penumbra, et cetera. But I I find it interesting that we're kind of like returning to that framework. Like, oh wait, we never quite got equality you know it wasn't they didn't find it in there they didn't get it in the shadow also not explicitly in the language and so we're kind of just coming full circle again um to we just can't skip over the era like i feel like each generation keeps trying to skip over it and be like oh we don't need that we have all this patchwork and it just comes back again and again and again like we're just it's going to keep resurrecting until it happens yep um so uh, 
I'm, I'm interested uh, in what you think a little bit more, like trying to dive into this a little bit more, because I know like a lot of the folks on the call tonight are very young. Um, and a lot of folks we're going to have at the Centennial Convention are young. Um, I think we have like maybe 60, at least 60% of the folks who are going to come are under the age of 25. Awesome. Um, I know. It's so exciting, everyone. I'm so glad you're here. Um, and today, even tonight, like on the Hill, uh, Rosie Kocher, who's the co-founder of Generation Ratify, Rosie um, just planned a little get together for uh, feminist Hill interns about the ERA. She had to expand the room. She had to get a new room because too many people RSVP'd. Then we had the the we had standing room only. There was literally like a line down the hall of Hill interns trying to get into this ERA uh, workshop. Like when young people find out about it, they care um, yes. and they get excited about it. Um, so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on, on, on kind of this, like, I don't know, I guess I'll call it a pivot um, or like a, a new, a fresh start for the ERA. Um, how can we work? Cause I know you've also worked with advocates and activists who, who've been working on the ERA since the 1970s. And I find like a real generational shift, like a generational um, adjustment between the way that we used to talk about the ERA and the way that we talk about it now, or that we want to talk about it going forward. What do you, what are your thoughts on the way, um, not only to bring, you know, and center women of color in the conversation, but also like talk about the things that people of color and young people care about most? How can we center those things in the ERA conversation? You know, that's a great question. I think we have to sometimes step back and remember what each generation has lived through. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a very quick story. It's not in the context of the ERA, but I think it'll, it'll help in, inform this. Um, you all may remember in February of 2019 here in Virginia, we had some scandals with our governor and a certain picture in his yearbook. Um, and um, and if you were living under a rock at the time, um, th there was a picture of a couple, someone in blackface and someone in a KKK uh, uniform or robe in his yearbook. And I attended a round table of multi-generational black women, all of whom were somehow involved in state government where we just talked, it was the first time since that day that that yearbook came out where we just talked about how we felt about it and how it impacted us. And you had a, a baby boomer, former cabinet secretary, who talked about how it triggered for her images and feelings and words and things that she felt as a child that she felt like, I thought we were done with this. You had, you know, again, me as Gen X, who was, you know, I thought this was something my parents had to deal with, but we were done with this. Um, and, 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 you know, everybody spoke except a young lady sitting next to me who was was Gen Z, who had just graduated from college. And I looked at her, I said, well, we need to hear from you. And she said, every one of you around this table has seen progress in your life. I was in elementary school when Barack Obama got elected president. The first election I voted in was in 2016. All my generation has seen is regression. All my friends and I talk about is why bother being involved in the political process? Rights are being taken away. The planet is dying. You know, why bother? And when she said that, it was a slap in the face to me. And it scared me because I thought, if you don't bother, we die as, as a democracy. But it was not until she said that in that moment that I really started to think about what has she lived through? And her life experience is very different than mine, born in 1972, you know, one month after, before Roe. Um, but now, so, so I think it's really important that each generation recognize our experiences are very different. 
and we need to stop and listen to each other and understand each other's perspectives so that we know what resonates more with each generation. You have to meet them where they are and not come at them expecting them to meet you where you are or be where you are. That's very helpful. Um, and I think we, like, it's hard because you're very much um, a diplomat and a, and a <laughs> politician and a bridge builder. And I think some, some of us who are more a bit, you know, firebrand activist, uh, uh, weirdo. You need, you, need, you need both. You need both. <laughs> Um, but I do think I, I really appreciate that perspective. And, and I do think, you know, a lot of times, like I, you know, I'm queer and I remember when my parents, um, my, I was raised Mormon and my parents were having a really hard time. My brother is also gay and he was, um, going to marry a man and my parents were having a really hard time and just being really antagonistic and like would only call his fiance, his, his roommate. And like, just a lot of, you know, just, it's not helpful. Um, and, and a lot of really hard time. And I was just like railing against them. And like, you know, we would have these arguments and I'd be like, you're ruining his life. You're da, 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 you know, and I wasn't making any progress to say the least. And uh, one of my professors, uh, uh, Pamela Bridgewater, um, American, my law professor, she was a dear friend of mine. And she said, why don't you, and she's also queer. And she said, why don't you take a different, why don't you pretend like, you know, they're good people and you know, they're good people. Um, she's like, why don't you just like pretend like you're all on the other side of this issue? And like stop railing against them, but give them opportunities to participate and like eventually they'll accept. And so I, I tried this different tactic where I would just be like, all right, let's go to the pride parade as if they were going to like <laughs> accept. And they would be like, no, you know, like we're not going blah, blah, blah. And then I would just be like, okay, maybe next year. Like I just tried this different approach coach and like again this isn't going to work every time but they eventually were like okay let's go to the pride parade you know like they did come out on the other side with like um invitations to like join us on the right side of history yeah, yeah. and I, I I hear what you're saying in that you know what I mean like let's invite folks to be on the right side of history. Let's invite them to be trans inclusive. Let's invite them to embrace abortion rights and freedom as part of our platform. Um, and I think like we can make progress in that way. Yeah, and, well, so, and I think I, I've had to be kind of, I had to become a diplomat, frankly, because when I got elected to the House of Delegates in 2005, I came in as a 32 year old black woman from the most democratic district in the state into a body that was mostly white Republican men over 50. And, and I also like, I grew up with parents who were older and um, I just, I kind of learned, it's like, you know, and I saw firsthand with my sister as she, you know, my sister would get into arguments with my dad and she'd never win. And I'd try a different tact and try to listen to where he's coming from. And I used that in, in the House of Delegates where I was like, okay, I need to understand why you believe what you believe. And that's when it really hit me that people's beliefs are shaped by their life experience and what they know. If I have a very different life experience, I need to step back and try to understand why do you believe what you believe? When you do that and then, and then share this is why I believe what I believe, because I have a very different experience. When you do that, more often than not, you will either find common ground or you'll find where you'll never have common ground. And that requires a very different strategy. And, but here's what I learned. Um, if you come at someone and say, oh, you're an idiot, you're, a racist, you're this, you're that, and the other, they're immediately going to shut down and not listen to anything that you say. If you come at them and say, here, 
I hear your perspective. I understand why you have that perspective. Let me share mine. And you do it calmly. They'll start to listen. And if you don't believe me, I, last week, I'm on, the, I'm on the Armed Services Committee. And some of the Republicans, Matt Gates in particular, they're trying to bring, you know, this, this war against wokeness in the, in the military. We spent like three hours debating amendments to eliminate diversity, equity, and inclusion programs in the military. And, and I sat and I'd listened to Matt Gates and my blood pressure started to rise. And it's probably good that I'm kind of junior. So by the time it got to me, I had like calmed down. And I just told the story. I said, look, my uncles didn't go to school beyond the eighth grade because in Mississippi, when they were children, the only school that deemed black children worthy enough to educate them was in the Catholic church. And it went to eighth grade. Their only choice afterwards was to go into the military where they were only allowed to cook. And they were called names, they were discriminated against, and they told their children those stories and their children did not want to go into the military. And their children's children didn't want to go into the military. And if you are going to recruit a you know, military that reflects the full diversity of the country they're trying to defend, that's an issue you need to address. And that's the point of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I could see some of the Republicans at the other side of the dais listening to me. And one came over to me. I had never met this man before in my life. And he had given a speech on one of these amendments earlier that it made my blood pressure rise. He came up to me, he introduced myself, and he said, you brought, you made some very good points that I had never thought of before. That is how we move hearts and minds. Now, not everybody can do it. I recognize it. Like I, I've had 50 years to practice doing that, but we've got to start having conversations like that rather than yelling at each other, even when it's hard, even when it's hard. Cause, cause you, you know, then he gave a speech about drag shows on, on base that I just thought like, okay, but I, I at least got him to listen to me on DEI when that morning he wouldn't have. And I, I, in, in church, we say everyone has different spiritual gifts. And I think that that's one of your spiritual gifts, uh, that, that you, um, are able to both hold the line in your values and core and, you know, not concede any, any of your dignity and, and, you know, power, but also meet people where they're at. And um, that's not easy, especially with, like you said, there's um, a lot of people on the other side of the aisle uh, and the federal level that are just saying some very, very hateful things. Um, and so I appreciate what you're saying and, and the cost um, that it takes, you know, it, it costs you, um, to make those arguments and to like be that diplomacy costs you. So I appreciate you yeah. and everything that you're doing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but you're so good at it and, and so effective. So I'm just, it's, it's absolutely just a absolute honor to have you on our side. Um, we have one question. I know we're, we're um, coming to the end of our hour and I want to be respectful of your time. Um, Sarah asks a question in the chat. Um, she said, as a member of Gen Z, uh, who has largely lived through this regression that you spoke of, um, the ERA feels too good to be true and unobtainable in the current political climate. Um, mm -hmm. What would you say to young activists who feel this way? Thank you, Sarah, for that question. I would say that my great great grandparents felt the same way about the right to vote. That John Lewis felt the same way about the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. Um, but they didn't give up. And every, you know, my biggest regret about serving in Congress right now is that I never got to serve with John Lewis. And he reminds us, he reminded his final words to us were democracy is not a state. It's an action that requires every generation to do its part. 
to fight for the beloved community, which is what he and Dr. King were fighting for. Mm -hmm. And throughout human history, there have been times where it seemed, you know, Dr. King knew he wasn't going to live to see the promised land. He knew that. But he fought it anyway because he knew his children could. I sometimes wake up and, and, and I'm frustrated and say, you know, I'm fighting the same fights that my mother and my grandmother and my great grandmother fought, but I keep fighting them so my daughter doesn't have to, so my son doesn't have to, and their children. So that's what's got to keep you going. If you give up, we will never achieve it. So feel, but, but, but I recognize you're going to have your moments where you feel like I can't do it. First, give yourself the grace to feel that because it's human. But then dig a little bit deeper and say, if I give up, then we never will achieve it. And that means that my children and my children's children are going to be left to fight this fight. Thank you. Uh, I, I completely agree. Um, and I also think, you know, I find dignity in the struggle. And um, the struggle is different from the outcome. <laughs> Um, and we have to find our dignity and our, our motivation and our passion in the struggle, um, because to do so is to embrace our full humanity, whether or not it is recognized, whether or not it is enshrined in the constitution, it mm -hmm. is to fight for our own humanity. So, um, you know, the ERA is not an easy issue to work on. <laughs> Um, so I appreciate your perspective um, and giving us a little bit of a longer, longer term view on that. Um, one more, we had one more um, comment in the, in the chat um, from Jimmy. Jimmy said that um, they met with a Republican congressman today who said he doesn't have an understanding of the ERA. And they asked him for a 30 minute Zoom training with him and his staff. And he said, yes. Oh, that's great. Um, so that's exciting. What are your what's your perspective? I know that you're, um, you know, just new, um, on the Hill, but do you have hope for, um, returning at least a few of your colleagues again, uh, across the aisle to the ERA? And what do you think about our best approach to work with Republicans? That's a great question. Um, I think it's important to remember that there are Republican voters and independent voters who support the ERA. And I think they need to, they need to understand that this is not a partisan issue. Um, it, and, and the more, frankly, the more Republicans and independents that we can include in the discussion, the better. Um, but helping them understand that equality should not be a partisan issue it's it's a human issue and why should you know women well let me also back up there are a lot of republicans who think the era means that in all circumstances you are going to treat men and women the same that's not what it means what it means is where those differences where those differences don't matter, the law is going to recognize that and treat them both as first-class citizens, <laughs> frankly, that, that women are not here to serve men. Now, some, some Republicans think that's exactly what they are. Um, but what this says is you will be treated fairly you will be treated equally under the law. And where there are differences that matter, like if you're pregnant, you probably need workplace accommodations so that you have a safe pregnancy. That's not, that's, that's fine under the ERA. Um, what's not fine is saying, we're gonna give everybody else an accommodation for, a health issue that keeps them from working, but if you're pregnant, we're not. So again, I, I think talking about some of the practical implications of what the ERA means and doesn't mean 
is helpful, whether it's Republicans, Democrats, or independents, um, and telling stories about how inequality under the law has impacted people. Yeah, I find that um, very hopeful. And I think you're right um, that, you know, these two sides of the coin can be true. We can take forward the ERA and create a record that makes it what we want it to be and what the people in the past um, had hoped it would be. And we can help people understand how basic and how rooted in, in human rights and basic dignity the ERA is. Um, and then if they don't agree, then, you know, we move forward without them. Um, but I think we've made really good strides. And I'll just say also, um, we just uh, passed a state ERA in Nevada oh, in, right. in, in November. And uh, it in the, in the election was like razor thin, like Cortez Masto almost lost. Democratic governor lost. Lute Democratic lieutenant governor lost. Like this is hardly a shoe in and in that election in that same election the equal rights amendment which included gender identity and expression included race included age included all of these other categories like it was a truly intersectional um you know project that same election the era won by 58.8 percent that's great and so equality is popular you know, more popular than any of the candidates on the ballot. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's more popular. It, it got Republican votes, you know, a huge amount of Republican votes in order to, to, to get the percentage it did. So I feel like I know when you when you say things like that, like, let's teach them about humanity. Let's like do that. But it is true. Like it actually worked and it and it works. It, it, people care about it. Equality is popular. It can be supported by Republicans. And I really appreciate your leadership and coming full circle to in the end in Virginia. You, you know, it, I think it was third event right in the mm -hmm. Republican uh, uh, sponsor in, in Virginia. So it was a truly bipartisan effort. Who, by the way, just defeated in a primary, Amanda Chase, who was the staunchest opponent against the ERA in 2019, uh, in a, in a, in a primary. So even, you know, even with Republicans. So he didn't suffer is the, is the moral of the story. You know what I mean? Like he, went out on a limb as a Republican, supported the equality, supported, you know, led on, on the ERA. And now he has defeated someone who was staunchly against it. So that's like a perfect example of how it can actually be popular for people of all political parties. Um, so amazing. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your wisdom. Thank you so much for your leadership and passion. Um, I, I just, I know there are so many Jennifer McClellan fans out there, um, and, and in the ERA world, you are just one of the brightest stars in the ERA firmament. So thank you. Thank you. Well, hopefully I will make the, the centennial, if not the, the, um, CBC has its event in New York and we haven't gotten our schedule yet, so, <laughs> but I'm going to try to make it work. Uh, we we have people in the chat saying, please, please come. We want to see you in Seneca Falls. <laughs> I didn't tell them to say that. Um, <laughs> it's so no, I want to be there. If I am not there, it is only because we could not make the planes, trains, and automobile schedule work with the CBC schedule. <laughs> Amazing. Well, we appreciate your leadership. Um, thrilled about being a vice chair of the caucus. Um, excited to continue this work for, forward and really take your lead. Thank you. You all have a great night. Cheers. You too.